and uh, that's it. <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So let me just. Uh, we've, we've got an hour. We'll uh, Joanne will make some introductions. We'll have some questions and answers, and uh, we'll take it away. So go ahead, Joanne. I'll keep letting okay. people in as they absolutely. Arrive. Okay. All right. So uh, welcome everyone to the November Boston chapter Zoom meeting. Uh, we have several things that we're going to be uh, looking at tonight. I want to thank everybody for uh, for coming. Uh, thank you, Bill, for getting things kicked off and get started and all. Um, what I want to say is that um, we we do have quite a few things that have been happening over the last month or so, uh, especially around the Boston chapter, which we, we will get to. Uh, but specifically what we are doing now is that we, we want to start a conversation with all of the New England chapters that are in our area. Now we're very lucky in this area because uh, we can all drive to a half a dozen different Saber chapter meetings, which is not really how it happens with the, uh, the rest of the country. So we decided uh, that we would call on Clayton Truda to come down from Vermont <laughs> in order to <laughs> tell us what, what he is up to and also what the chapter is up to. And our intention is to go around to the other chapters in New England and talk to people who are either at the forefront or they're running the chapters or they just have a big interest in it. And this is something that came out of an idea that uh, had laid a little bit in the background many years ago. And actually I do believe it started up in Vermont uh, with Tom Simon. And where we had wanted to do an all New England conference, as it were, bring everybody all together. Well, it never really got off the ground for one thing. We couldn't decide where to have the meeting and things just kind of uh, figured out. So with the Zoom meetings, we think that this might be a good way to accomplish that uh, without everybody having to get too out of line and certainly will save um, on hotel expenses. So we decided that we would get Clayton because uh, he has just written a book and we are going to be very interested in hearing about it. But also, besides that, uh, we also have a few things of uh, a more Boston-centric interest uh, that are going on right now. Um, Saul Wisnia is going to do a few uh, words about what he has been up to. And also, he is going to give us uh, a few words about Jerry Remy, who just recently passed away. Now, also, uh, one last thing before I pass it back. Uh, back over to you guys. Um, we received a letter, and if you can all know the logo there, uh, from the Woo Sox, where we had had a meeting in July, and they wrote a short note um, on the card, and I think it's uh, well worth uh, listening to, but, and it states, and it's from uh, Ryan Nutt. I wanted to write to thank you for your support during the inaugural season. We were amazed at how many people we're able, we were able to welcome into the Polar Park in 2021. It was especially a pleasure to host Sabre and show off all of the wonders of our beautiful new stadium. Hopefully this is just what we need to revitalize the Worcester chapter. I look forward to hosting you again in 2022. I'll be in touch with available dates and options to welcome you back before the new year. And so that comes from Ryan who had uh, managed um, the, uh, the, uh, the meeting that we had there. And uh, for any of you that did happen to go to that particular one, uh, we lasted just at the top of the second <laughs> without the first battery even coming up. So uh, with a monumental rainstorm <laughs> that came through Worcester and totally inundated everything, but uh, we'll try again. So, um, so anyway, um, Saul, what have you got to tell us about? <laughs> well, uh, it's tough to top uh, monsoons in Worcester. Yeah, I know, but, really. <laughs> but uh, there is a little bit of a Worcester connection to uh, mm -hmm. one thing I'm, I'm doing on Monday. Um, so I, I, most of you probably know that I, I do publications at Dana-Farber. And on Monday, we are going to be dedicating a new virtual screen in the Jimmy Fun Clinic um, that has been dedicated by the Lucchino family. Um, and so, and I was hoping Larry was gonna be there so I could see him, but unfortunately, because he's a three-time cancer survivor with the COVID protocol, 
I guess it's not so safe for him to, to come into the clinic. So I'm not sure if Dr. Charles or somebody else is going to be there. I was thinking I might email him tomorrow to see, but um, you know, the Lucchino family, uh, Larry, Larry is, uh, you know, he's chairman of the Jimmy fund uh, still in addition to being um, still involved with the, with the Woo Sox and, and the Red Sox. Um, but as a three-time survivor, true to Dana Farber, he is uh, always doing a lot of stuff for Dana Farber and the Jimmy Fund. And of course, I just realized that also ties into the Braves because um, as Clayton knows, the, the Boston Braves, not the Red Sox, started the Jimmy Fund and then passed it off to the Red Sox when they went to Milwaukee in 1953. Uh, and the Red Sox, especially Ted, really picked up the, picked up the ball from, from the Braves. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, of course, uh, we did have the passing of Jerry Remy, uh, who was first a, a, a great um, hometown uh, ball player for the Red Sox. He went from being a kid who stormed the field uh, the last day of the 67 season to celebrate the impossible dream to being a kid who was almost, uh, or a guy who was almost there when they when they uh, won a championship in 78. Unfortunately, they didn't. I took a little advantage of um, revisionist history and I created a, a blog story that I posted on my blog where his ball got by Lou Pinella for an inside the park home run, scoring him and Burleson to win the game six to five and the fans stormed the field. So um, he got to, you know, see both sides and then Yaz greeted him at home plate. I mean, as I was writing it, I was realizing all these really cool and you know angles of the whole thing. Um, you know, that that uh being a hometown kid and Yaz was his favorite player, and then here he was playing with him. Um, but uh Jerry was also a great friend to the Jimmy Fund and and Dana Farber, of course. Uh he was not a patient at Dana Farber, his specialist was at Mass General, but um he still uh every year for the radio telethon was a huge supporter on air and off. And I remember when I met him at the clinic once, he, he said that he really had a hard time going there. He was really uncomfortable in hospitals. Um, uh, this was actually, I think even before his own diagnosis, but that he really pushed himself to go um, because he knew how important it was. And um, so I thought that really I had a lot of respect for that because it wasn't a natural thing for him. I mean, just like broadcasting wasn't a natural thing for him at first. He was very, uncomfortable with being in the spotlight and drawing attention to himself and of course ended up being a natural um so i think it was a natural uh in the clinic as well uh so um i don't know if anybody here uh, maybe bill was at his uh went to the uh went to the service they had i almost went when it was in waltham right down the street from me but i but i didn't have time um but obviously it was a great uh outpouring of support I mean, very few guys kind of, just the fact that he transcended, you know, it was two, three generations of people that loved Remy, um, really, uh, really spoke a lot. Um, I mean, the guy suffered in many, many ways, and it was always just so good on the, on the air. I mean, just terrific, um, no matter who he was talking to, nor who he was paired with, so um you know, I hope that I hope they rename Jersey Street Jerry Remy Way. I think it's a great mm -hmm. idea. I mean, you know, better than, recall, name, better, better than naming it after that slaveholder from England. Yeah, exactly. The world of Jersey. Yeah, no, ex I was just going to say that, Bill. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, when when they changed it away from Yaki, I know there were a few stories yeah. about the fact that Jersey was a slave owner. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, I mean, originally I wanted to be like Louis Tian Boulevard, but I think mm -hmm. Jerry Remy Way would be fine. Um, it actually kind of is rather rhythmic, Jerry Remy Way. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Louis got his, his you know, his, his uh, Cuban hot dog stand. So Cuban sausage stand. So, you know, Remy can have the street. And actually, it passes very close to where Jerry Remy's restaurant was. So, you know, um, anyway, but uh, if, I don't know if anybody has an anecdote about Remy they want to share before I throw it back to to Bill um, to introduce Clayton, but um, Bill, you 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 saw the guy a million times up in the press box. Well, I, yeah, but I'd like to leave. Uh, make sure we leave enough time for 
for okay. Clayton here because we are kind of limited uh, in all the right. available time. I think we all have uh, some memories of him being a New England guy that spoke to a New England audience. It's it's kind of, it was kind of unique in in many ways. Jerry Remy, I think he really connected in a way that maybe people in other parts of the country can't appreciate as much. Even the accent and the way yeah, he was yeah. like oh, wicked piss uh, and all that stuff. Yeah, it was great. So Joanne, uh, well, Clayton, why don't you, you can just introduce yourself. I think uh, you, uh, you and I worked on a book together, your idea to do the book uh, on uh, overcoming adversity to tell the story of the, the uh, Tony Canigliero award. And uh, you and I edited that book together. And uh, now you've got a book on your own that why don't you just tell us about it and uh, take it away. Thank you guys for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Clayton Truder. I uh, teach U.S. history at Norwich University in Vermont. I went to grad, grad school at Boston College, and uh, my new book is called Loserville, A Professional Sports Remade Atlanta and How Atlanta Remade Professional Sports. It's an outgrowth of my dissertation from a number of years ago. Over time, I eventually turned it into a book. The book essentially tells the story of Atlanta's pursuit of pro sports in the 1960s. Atlanta had no pro sports teams as of 1965. By 1972, they have teams in all four of the major professional sports leagues. Uh, after Atlanta pursues the teams and they arrive in town, the Braves of the National League, the Falcons of the National Football League, the uh, Hawks of the National Basketball Association, and the Flames of the NHL, Atlanta's fans eventually have a kind of lukewarm response to the local teams. Partially, it's because they get so many teams so quickly. Partially, it's because there are divides in the city, whether it's an urban-suburban divide, a divide between transplants and, uh, and longtime residents of the area, racial divides in the region. You go into all of that in the book, uh, as well as much about the history of the city, its politics, its economics, some of its social uh, dynamics as well. But essentially, this is the story of one of the early expansion cities and probably the first city that made a concerted corporate effort to become major league. There had obviously been lots of franchise relocations before, certainly the Braves moving from Boston to Milwaukee, probably most famously with the Dodgers and the Giants moving out west. But what Atlanta does is something a little bit different in the 1960s. They have a mayor named Ivan Allen who gets elected in 1961. He's the head of the city's Chamber of Commerce, and he runs on a platform called Major League City. His idea is that Atlanta will go from being a important regional economic hub to a genuinely national city by becoming a city of pro sports. He wanted Atlanta's names to appear in the standings alongside New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and Los Angeles. It would be visible proof by having this cultural amenity that Atlanta was one of the country's major cities. So Atlanta rolls out the red carpet to the major professional sports leagues, um, making significant civic investments in what becomes Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, the home of the Braves and the Falcons, as well as the Omni Coliseum, which becomes the home of the uh, Hawks and Flames. They do this for prestige uh, in the city of Atlanta, but also as a way to try to serve as a source of civic unity. And none of this really works out quite as expected. Um, looking, looking into the past, it's easy to say, well, these were kind of foolhardy efforts, but nobody had really done what the city had done before. Essentially, Atlanta created a pioneering vision for how cities could go from being just a regional hub in the South or the West to becoming a major league by making these significant investments in pro sports. And it also, in a broader sense, changes the logistics of pro sports in North America as well. It creates an ongoing competition for, for teams among cities, whether it's an older city in the North or the Midwest or a newer city in the, uh, in the Sun Belt. This ongoing competition, this arms race for stadiums throughout the continent. So this is both the story of a city as well as its particular teams. It goes through the blow by blow of the Braves uh, as well as the other teams. But it also is a national story as well. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, I think I think that's the basic concept for the book. Um, in terms of um, in terms of specifics with the Braves, I can I can go into that if that that probably makes sense. Um, I mean, the Braves obviously moved from Milwaukee. They uh, in October nineteen sixty four, the the Braves announced that they're going to relocate from Milwaukee to Atlanta. Uh, you'd had an ownership group that came in in 1962 that was primarily the sons of um, 
wealthy uh, scions of Chicago business owners that takes over the Braves in 62. They try to have a stock sale uh, of the Braves to try to recoup their investment. Um, you got to think about the context of this being in Wisconsin. You have the 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 Green Bay Packers have, you know, they're, they're a community owned team. They want to essentially do the same thing with the Braves. It doesn't work out very well. The locals see it as being this kind of cynical cash grab. Uh, the Braves also are beginning to struggle in the standings, struggle at the box office after being a very successful and popular draw in the Milwaukee throughout much of the um, uh, throughout much of the 1950s. And when this new city that is offering to build them a new stadium offers them a seven state market where there are no professional sports teams, essentially comes uh, comes offering them a new uh, opportunity. They, they take advantage of it. They sign a lease with the city of Atlanta. And this leads to about a year and a half long legal battle for control of this franchise between Milwaukee County. where The Braves are forced to play a lame duck season in 1965 and the city of Atlanta, where the team as early as April 1965 moves all of their operations while the team is still forced to play in Milwaukee. So amid this ongoing legal drama, uh, the Braves have a very difficult situation, this, this lame duck Milwaukee team that nobody locally supports and is just essentially sitting around waiting to come to town. When the Braves get to Atlanta, the, uh, they come in as a team that has very high hopes. The 65 Braves do very well in the, um, do very well in the National League. Many national publications favor the Braves in 66 to become National League champions. Uh, that certainly doesn't happen. They struggle out the gate. Uh, their coach, Bobby Bragan, or their manager, Bobby Bragan, gets fired. And um, it in many ways sets up the, uh, I guess, the the standard practice of the Braves in the 1960s and 1970s. They were often an underachieving team. They have the aberration of the 69 divisional championship. But in general, uh, this Atlanta team struggles in their early years in town and go from being a pretty good draw in their first year in 66, they draw 1.5 million fans, which for context is less than the Braves drew to Milwaukee in 53. When they come to town, they draw 1.8 million fans, which was at the time the National League attendance record. Um, the Braves attendance just gets worse and worse and worse. And by 1970, they're drawing under a million fans a year. They don't draw a million fans again until 1980. For the, over the course of the 1970s, the Braves are the worst drawing team in baseball on an average annual basis. Um, and uh, eventually the, the ownership kind of gives up on the team. Uh, 1975, the year after Aaron leaves, is kind of the, the, I guess, the last straw. The Braves finish 40 and a half games out of first place in the National League West. The ownership group uh, decides it's, um, uh, the ownership group decides it's uh, time to pull up stakes. And uh, they, they drew, I did I say, 500 something thousand fans that year. And, um, they sell the team to Ted Turner. They sell it to him on the installment plan. He buys the team for $10 million over 10 years. Turner gives them $1 million a year from 76 to 85 to purchase the team, which was essentially unprecedented. Baseball, uh, the other owners in the National League were very hesitant about Turner, fearing he's going to be this maverick, this kind of outlier as an owner. They don't like the financial plan. But in fact, Turner proves to be a very stable force for baseball in Atlanta, which could very well have left without him. In many ways, the hero of the story is Ted Turner. He saves the Braves for Atlanta, as well as the Hawks, whom he purchases the following year in 1976. They serve as inexpensive programming for his, uh, for his network for many years. And, and uh, Turner, in many ways, is a kind of civically minded capitalist as well, who does this thing that in the long run serves Atlanta, at least in the sense of national prestige, quite well. Uh, I did a blog post that my book is being published by the University of Nebraska Press. I did a blog post for them the other day after the Braves won their championship saying that no small part of the story has to be Ted Turner, who left Atlanta, a major league city in the 1970s. Um, I see questions are starting to come in. I'll be happy to answer those particular questions about the book. Um, let me see in the chat. Uh, if you see the first one, it yeah. oh, why did they draw so poorly in Atlanta, even with Aaron as a major draw? I think in terms of Aaron, there's the issue that there's the lack of novelty over time. Um, he was a very consistent home run hitter, didn't have the huge totals <laughs> until later in his career. Well, I mean, I think he has the 47 home runs, yeah. um, which which I think there's certainly a spark with that. But I think part of the issue is that. But I think that's more more minor compared to 
I don't think it really mattered who they had unless they were winning championships with this team in terms of drawing well. Um, you had such a suburban population there that the city of Atlanta even then constituted less than a quarter of the metro area's population, which relative to other cities in 1970 was a much smaller percentage. Fans who commuted into Atlanta for work who commuted back out after work. The idea of coming back to the city to sit out in the hot Georgia sun on a July or August night was not terribly appealing, especially when the team was in fourth or fifth place often. So I think the profoundly suburban nature of the area was an issue with it. The large transplant population was an issue that all the teams faced. Um, you go to a game in Atlanta, see a lot of New York or Philadelphia or whomever they're playing shirts to this day. Um, it's out of the population. Um, so it's very, um, it's, it's a, a very difficult place to draw in terms of that. Certainly, this is a southern city coming out of the Jim Crow era. That's got to be an aspect of the story as well. Although Aaron points out in his memoir, in terms of at least during the home run race, in terms of his hate mail, he said in terms of both <laughs> volume and vociferousness, the worst hate mail he received was often from outside of the South. Sure. So Aaron, 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 you know, dealt with this from a lot of different angles. But that has to certainly be kept in mind as part of this context as well. Um, in terms of the stadium itself. Um, uh, the parking situation wasn't very good. This is a profoundly suburban area. Um, you also don't have a mass transit option to get to the stadium until really until the mid 1980s. Uh, MARTA doesn't open their, their rapid transit system until 1979. It doesn't even get within one mile of the stadium until 1985. Um, for much of the later years of Fulton County Stadium, you could either walk from Georgia State University's campus or take a shuttle from underground Atlanta to get to the stadium. So if you wanted to take mass transit to get to the game, that wasn't really an option. Yep. Um, so those are some of the many reasons why the Braves and as well as the other teams did not draw well. I think the Braves in many ways took the brunt of Atlanta's, just the title of the book Loserville comes from a series of columns in the mid 1970s, the Atlanta constitution, um, um, titled Loserville talking about the teams uh, utility in the box uh, at the box office and on the field during this time period. Um, so, in terms of the Loserville label, that probably affected the Braves the most. They're playing eight months out of the year. They're the first team in town. They were probably the most prestigious one to come to town because it was Atlanta showing it was part of the national pastime. So, I think as much as any team, the Braves took the brunt of this um, this assault. I hope that answered the question in terms of Aaron. In terms of the home run race, there was a particular embarrassment to how poorly the Braves drew during this time period. In 73 and 74, the Braves were the best drawing road team in the National League, but second or third worst in overall attendance in both of those years in the National League for home attendance. So there was a very blasé attitude towards, towards Aaron's chase in Atlanta. Um, he has a full house the night he breaks the record in a April 8, 74. The next night they draw 10,000. The night after that, they draw 3,500. And they're back to their typical weeknight crowds of a couple of thousand uh, people. So very quickly, uh, enthusiasm dissipated in, in, in the city for that. Um, if, if I could interject, um, I, um, I live in Maryland, but I'm from Connecticut. But I've lived in Atlanta for three and a half years in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to just dovetail up a couple things you said. Um, Atlanta has often caught a real lot of flack for being a terrible sports, pro sports town. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt they missed a very important point. As you said, they were no pro sports in, in Atlanta at all until the late 60s. Mm -hmm. But Atlanta is a huge college sports market. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I mean, you, you I don't know the folks in New England. I know me as a native New England. You you have no clue what the Georgia Florida football game is like. Trust me. I mean, it is. Oh, it I, is, I go into great detail. In I that know you book. do. I mean, you probably do. Yeah, I mean, um, part of the issue is they have a they have their own sports culture before the big leagues gets there. Um, right. The weekend the Braves in 1969 host the NLCS. Those two games are the fourth and fifth best drawing sports events in the Atlanta region that weekend. The best drawing is the Georgia football game. Second best drawing is Georgia Tech. Third best drawing is the Falcons with the Baltimore Colts coming into town. People really wanted to go see Johnny Unitas for the first right. time in town. And then the Bruins and Mets are the fourth and fifth best drawing games that weekend. So, wow. I mean, it's the eye opening event for me 
in, in February of 1997, just a couple of weeks after I had moved there, I opened the Atlanta Journal Constitution Sports section, and there are six full pages on National Signing Day. Okay. <laughs> uh, how many stories are in the Boston Globe on National Signing Day? <laughs> Walter, um, how about when the when the when the BC Eagles were number two in the country, and and like they weren't even leading off the uh, yeah. You know, yeah, the sports cast. I mean, he, he, only the Flutie years. Did anybody pay attention to BC? Football? Right. Well, they're, they're the college, I mean, the college football tradition, which something I, I had to explain to people that, well, who's your college team? Well, I went to UMass. Don't talk to me. <laughs> you know? hey, they beat UConn this year. I mean, <laughs> but, but uh, the other thing I did want to mention, though, that is very important, I think, when you talk about Atlanta. I, and I was part of the transient community. I moved from a Northeastern company to Atlanta in the 1990s, just as hundreds of thousands of people moved from all over the country. And you're right, when the Braves played the Cubs, they were the road team. I mean, it, it, even when they had, and I was there when Glavin Maddox and Smoltz and all, Chipper and all those people were there. Um, but you can't ever talk about Atlanta, and I, you know you did mention it without talking about race. Because when you talk about the transient community, the white community is transient in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The black community is not. Well, I, I, actually, I somewhat disagree with. I mean, well, I, yeah, there are actually become a mecca of black capital, not. certainly. Yeah, but I mean, in recent well, decades, that's, I think it's changed a bit. But, I, I was, Kelly, it, now, Walter, can I? I, I wanted to, because my question, the second one I had there, and I'm just going to ask it out loud. Um, you know, I, I wondered whether, you know. Yes, it was, you know, the, the, the people that lived there, I agree, were, and I spent some time in Atlanta, not, not like Walter, but, um, you know, was largely you know, African-American, the people that were there for, to stay. But was there any thought given to kind of trying to make it into almost like, you know, the African-American team in so much as like making Aaron the manager? I mean, when they, when they fired Matthews, it would have been such a natural well, I, mean, I think that know, ship had already sailed yeah, in the, part the because of how the stadium gets built. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the stadium was urban renewal land that was earmarked for affordable housing. The minute pro sports sniffed coming to town, the city said, bye bye, no affordable housing. We're going to build a stadium there. Okay. And this was in the heart of the, of the historically black neighborhood in South Atlanta. Yes. Wow. The neighborhoods which surround it are historically very and very impoverished neighborhoods. Um, right. So I think there was a, a real resentment from that. Okay. And I would say really also good. for really many of those yeah. for many of those neighborhoods, this was a primary source of employment. This was a very nearby employer. If you lived in Vine City or People's Town or Summer Hill or one of the neighborhoods surrounding it, um, your relationship to the team may was more likely as an employer, as an employee, than as a fan. And, and and I very frequently see people saying, well, ha having having conflictual relationships with the employees at the stadium, there's obvious racial overtones when you read these uh, these uh, letters to the editor from the 60s and 70s. It's kind of a, a silent place to find these kind of conflicts when after people, uh, it had become more taboo for people to say some of these things out loud in, in a polite conversation. Right, and they're still there. Uh, Turner Field also, you should mention, I was there the year it opened, Turner Field was right across from where Fulton County Stadium was, but of course we all paid for Turner Field. Turner Field was yes. the Olympic Stadium. It was uh, we our taxpayer dollars paid to build it, and then we gave Ted Turner another hundred thirty million dollars to retrofit it for baseball. Thank you very much. And then they got rid of it twenty years later because of the neighborhood it's in. Yeah. Yes, now absolutely. It's, now it's in a neighborhood that seems to be people just say it's not, you know nowhere and you can't get there. Oh, it's awful. I mean, you can't, yeah, no, it. Why not revitalize the neighborhood? Why not? Why didn't Turner try to put an effort into revitalizing the neighborhood around it, like they tried uh, to do in Cleveland and Detroit, rather than just you know, whatever? Turner sold, you know, with, with the with the um, with the takeover of his company and and his business um, empire changing, he got less and less involved pretty quickly. The present owners certainly have no no interest in doing that. In terms of the Aaron becoming manager thing, that's really the reason he ends up leaving the organization. After what he talks about retiring after the 74th season, they're going to give them this very token PR position. He's like, no way. 
I'm either going to play, I'm either going to get a managerial role. I'm going to play an important role in scouting. He didn't have any interest in, in, in that, uh, in that kind of relationship with, with that ownership group. Turner very much embraces Aaron and gets him in a much more active role in the organization and much more embraces the legacy of 715 and the previous ownership group. So Turner, I think also brings Aaron back into the organization, which he had left with a uh, very sour taste in his mouth after the 74 season. No, that is, that's great that he did that. And when, when Aaron died and then again, during the series, during the world series and, you know, talking about his connection to both managers in the world series, you really got a newfound appreciation for just, I got to admit, as much as I loved Aaron as a player, I didn't really think about his baseball intelligence as much as I probably should have when, because he was never a manager. And I just, I assumed his roles were not as serious as they were, but I mean, being head of the farm system and then, you know, choosing people that ended up becoming obviously major executives and managers in the system. And all these people that came out of the room are talking about what a brilliant mind he was. It was really wasted that, that he didn't get a chance to do that as, as a manager. Um, you know, cause he should have been first. I mean, it was great that Frank Robinson was, but it should have been Aaron would have been, would have been great. Yes. They totally, that organization totally flubbed it as they did many things, but, but in essence, they were absentee owners. I mean, virtually all of the guys, in what was called the LaSalle Corporation, uh, were Chicago based and had relatively little to do with the day to day operations of the organization. There was a guy named Bill Bartholomew, who was the, the face of the organization for much of the time period, who's a very respected guy, I gather, in um, um, National League circles during the time. But uh, yeah, I, and that's a major problem all of these Atlanta teams had was ownership in their early years. The Falcons were owned by an insurance guy named Franken Smith, who was great at selling insurance policies had basically non-football people running the organization. The Falcons in 1967 had an NFL draft where none of the guys they selected made their team. <laughs> they, they, they made, tw this is an expansion team, a bad expansion team. And still this insurance man uh, who made all the picks just didn't pick the right guys to make this NFL roster. Um, keeping in mind the roster is further weakened by the American Football League taking a lot of good players in this time period too. So it was pretty rough in terms of the Hawks and the flames. They have Tom Cousins owning the team. Who's Mr. Atlanta, big, big real estate guy. That was really his focus. He had really no hands-on role with those organizations. He turned it over to, uh, to other people in his organization. So it, it, ownership wise, that was a real weakness for these teams. Uh, I, I think in a broader sense, people underestimated how difficult and how particular a business pro sports was. Just because you're a fantastic businessman in some other field doesn't necessarily going to mean you're going to succeed in this one. And the owners in both Atlanta, as well as many other Sunbelt cities, whether it's San Diego or Tampa or Houston, found the same thing out, too. So in many ways, this is an origin story for what happens in a lot of these other cities in the 60s and 70s and 80s, who essentially follow Atlanta's rolling the red carpet out corporate model for becoming big league. Does your book co cover, and obviously it covers baseball, but you cover other sports and, and beyond, or is it mostly this is, sports oriented? This, this book is, uh, it's, it's, I, I view it as a history of the city and its teams. It's, yeah. it's, there's a great deal about the politics of Atlanta, the economy, what's going on socially as well as the history of the four teams, the four major sports teams in the city. I also talk, I, I talk a lot about what I call the pre-major pre league sporting culture there. I talk a lot about college football. I talk a lot about professional wrestling, which is shockingly popular <laughs> in Georgia. Um, mm -hmm. When they built the Omni, on Friday nights, they would have Pete Maravich, the best-known basketball player in the country, playing for the Hawks. And they would frequently get out and drawn by pro wrestling at an armory one mile down the road, an unair conditioned armory built during the Cleveland administration, um, as opposed to people who can sit in plush seats and watch Pete Maravich play basketball, um, stock car racing, golf. There's a tremendous number of, of sports that were incredibly popular in the region that um, those fans didn't just stop paying attention to them because they were major league teams wearing Atlanta across their chest. Golf and tennis are huge in, in Georgia. Um, you, uh, if you're selling a home in a subdivision there that doesn't have tennis courts, you're at a huge disadvantage. Clayton, I'm curious, did, did, um, did you know, as I, the biggest employer that I can think of in Atlanta, unless, you know, I'm not thinking of the right one is, is Coke or, you know, I mean, well, I'd, say the, I'd say the airport probably. Delta, UPS. Yeah. Okay. 
So, mm. but in the seventies, yeah, I guess even then, yeah, uh, not you, maybe not UPS yet, but um, it, did it, was there ever thought of any of those, you know, major giants taking, you know, buying the team or, or becoming involved in the ownership group more than they were? Not really, because once the honeymoon wore off in a couple of years, the the standard way for, I guess, prominent people at Atlanta to regard the teams went from being this just rabid booster of the teams to a very studied nonchalance, blasé attitude towards pro sports. Oh, our teams lose. That's what they do. You can certainly see it in the city's newspapers during this era, too. But almost overnight, the narrative goes from being, OK, we're finally major league. We finally made it to. Eh, who cares about those teams? I mean, the Braves uh, for a couple of years in 75 and 76 did not have reporters from the Constitution and Journal going on the road to cover the teams. They just listened to the game on the radio and wrote up a story. Unbelievable. That's with wow. no pandemic. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, had a, they, had a great, they had a great, they had a great um, traveling secretary, though. Donald Davidson. Oh, yes, absolutely. That guy is, a, I mean, a Boston native. Used to hang around Bray's Field as a kid. Hmm. Was a, fa- a real favorite of Babe Ruth, and he was uh, a little person. Yeah, his uh, book caught shorts fat. Yeah, 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 and like the stuff that like <laughs> that Matthews and Aaron and Spahn used to do to him, like you know, not letting him, not picking him up to get to the right floor in the elevator and stuff. I mean, you know, so he couldn't push the buttons. I mean, I don't think it would be very PC today, but he seemed to not mind. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was there when the Thrashers briefly came into existence and seemed to vanish overnight. <laughs> Maybe oh. it just seemed that way. Um, where they thought that because of all the northern implants they had there, lots of lots of people in Atlanta that I met, I know when I worked there, were from Chicago, Detroit, and places like that originally. And they, you know, they thought they'd bring their love of hockey to Atlanta, but it uh, I mean they're over two with the NHL there. Well and my book makes a fairly uh, um, um, uh, dramatic defense of the names. The names, I think, are a little bit misunderstood. They actually had above average attendance in six yeah. of their eight years. They made yeah. the postseason in six of the eight years. Their real problem was their owner, Tom Cousins, got in trouble with his real estate empire. He built the yeah. Omni International Complex, uh, which opened in 75, and by 78 is the largest real estate bankruptcy in U.S. history, and he's looking to get out from it. He's got these oil men in Alberta saying, we'll give you $20 million for your team, but paid $6 million for. The price is pretty good when you have a you know, $100 million bankruptcy going on. So the Flames, um, I think in retrospect, the perception of them is that they were a lot worse than they were. The Thrashers really did not do very well. I think they faced the problem a lot of Sunbelt teams do in the NHL. There's maybe ten or 12,000 people in the market who are just rabid about them become season ticket holders there are no casual fans there's nobody who's going to flip on the thrashers game and kind of casually watch the second and third period and i think that more broadly hurt um has hurt hockey in the belt and it certainly hurt the flames earlier on too because they very explicitly marketed towards the upscale clientele their ads were called atlantis ice society they presented it as the new friday and saturday night out in atlanta uh wearing furs and suits and sitting in these nice theater seats at the omni this was going to be the way you spent your evenings. And for a few years, it worked very nicely. I mean, the Flames at one point had 11,000 season ticket holders, but uh, that, that proved short-lived. Well, from a season, my sense is the most rabid era in Atlanta pro sports history, ironically, and I, I had moved since then. But the Michael Vick Falcons, uh, I think they had 70,000 season ticket holders or something in that neighborhood. Well, a- I mean, absolutely. He, he was huge. I don't think people, I mean, Michael Vick is obviously a pariah in, a lot, in most circles today, but Atlanta loved him. Well, and I think that that related to particularly a transitioning the fan base of both the Hawks and the Falcons. As Atlanta's back middle class expanded beginning in the 70s and the 80s, you had you had you had more more fans who were capable of affording season tickets, and as African American fans who were interested in basketball or football had the opportunity to buy these, they they found first with the with the Hawks with the Dominique Wilkins, Spud Webb, Mike Fratello era team it was a very exciting team to watch. All of a sudden, they went from the Hawks had below average attendance in each of their first eighteen seasons to being one of the best drawing, most viewed teams in the NBA overnight because of this exciting team and its confluence with an expanding fan base 
interested in investing, interested and capable of investing in the teams. Essentially, the same thing happens with the Falcons. It has a, even before the Vic run, there's a shorter run in the early 90s with the Jerry Glanville, Andre Rise, and Deion Sanders wearing the black uniforms, which very quickly became a, an, an aspect of popular culture, uh, particularly associated with hip hop culture, and it helped them expand their fan base during that time period as well. Uh, I mean, if you attend a Falcons game now, I would suggest the crowd is predominantly African-American in most of those games, which reflects an expansion of uh, Atlanta's black middle class as well. And conversely, a Braves crowd is overwhelmingly white. Absolutely. Absolutely. And moving out to Cobb County further exaggerated that, too. I mean, the argument of the team. They had, you know, negotiated secretly, essentially, with this business district in Cobb County to finance the stadium. They said, hey, look, look at our fan base. They, they published a map of their season ticket holders, and it was largely affluent northern suburbs like Cobb County. But truthfully, I went to many, many, many games at Turner Field, and, and the crowd was overwhelmingly white there, too. Mm-hmm. The difference was they had to travel to go there. It's really, mm-hmm. it's so sad. I mean, because there's such a history of you know, a- African-Americans loving baseball in the South and, 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 and becoming successful major leaguers and Negro leaguers. And, and it's just, uh, it's just, what a, what a, um, what a draught ball. But I, I just, two, two questions. Um, one is, did you ever, this is just a kind of a weird curiosity type thing, but did you ever come across anything about Martin Luther King um, and the King family being fans of the Braves at any point. Um, and I'm curious also if the, what the Braves did around, I know it was opening day or around opening day when he was assassinated in 68. And then my other question was not really about the area you wrote about, but my God, the tomahawk chop, it's got to go. I mean, if it Chief will. Wahoo is gone, I mean, and that's a Ted Turner thing. I mean, I remember... Ted and Jane Fonda sitting in the front row doing the chop. Um, my God, when are they going to retire that? Do you remember well, Chief Nakahoma? Nakahoma? Oh, I, I do. I do. I yeah. 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 Well, I'll answer the first, second one first. I think the tomahawk chop will, will, will disappear on its own eventually. I think we're in a particular, obviously, a very contentious cultural moment. I think that a less contentious moment is likely to be the time when it disappears, when it becomes a more taboo thing to do. When people, I think, are confronted being told you can't do something, they're a lot less likely to not do it. I think in many ways, um, uh, cultural changes end up being what's upstream from more, I guess, foundational changes. And I, I think over time that's going to disappear. I, I, I would be very surprised if it doesn't. But I, I think it's going to take a little bit. It's not going to happen year after year and win the World Series. I mean, people will see it as an act of defiance kind of thing, I, I, I think. But I, th- I think I think it's, it, it's, it's hopefully going to evolve out of, out of being a thing eventually. In terms of King, actually his father, Martin Luther King Sr., known as Daddy King in Atlanta, is a more prominent figure in the book because he's really part of the Atlanta, um, the, the Black uh, establishment in Atlanta in the 50s and 60s that is very supportive of moves to become major league. Um, there, I mean, Atlanta from the from the early night, or I guess the late 1940s onward, is essentially a biracial governing coalition. Um, there, there's a guy named William Hartsfield, the airport's you know named after him now, who's the mayor from the late 30s through the early 1960s. He ends up build, building his electoral coalition essentially around white professionals and black voters. In 1948, there's a there's a change in uh, voting laws. That enables a broader expansion of black voting in Atlanta. Atlanta goes from having roughly 3,500 black voters to like 60,000 in like a five-year period. So this this quickly cements itself into the winning electoral coalition in Atlanta. It was in coalition is essentially the white working class coalition that is Lester Maddox's political coalition for the most part. Um, so the, I mean, there's kind of a, that's essentially the political dynamic in the city for a, for a long period of time. But as the stadium but the stadium deal comes into place. Um, Martin Luther King Sr. is one of many leaders who are supportive of the move to push forward with trying to become a major league city. Uh, I mean, essentially, the entirety of the city's establishment, whether it's the white corporate establishment, uh, the black political establishment, are very supportive of this move. Great answer. Um, Another date. What about 95? The the World Series. um, in, in, I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's, the, it's a fantastic upset victory. I mean, really, I mean, the Cleveland Indians, I say, were certainly favored in that series. 
And in some ways, I think if one looked to to that 90s uh, record of teams, it wouldn't have been the one you would have expected to end up winning the championship. Yeah. Even during the series, Dave Justice, David Justice criticizes the Braves fans for being for being milk toast during the series. I think it's game two in Atlanta. He's like, oh, if only we had fans like they did in like they do at Jacobs Field. And that caused the to kind of rally the yeah. troops. But even in the midst of this greatest moment of glory, I mean, you have a, a major player on the Braves criticizing their blase uh, attitude of their fans. It is yeah, amazing. It really, that, but it really that, was a great organization. I mean, yeah. I mean, the organization they built in the 90s, it doesn't get, because they only won World, one World Series, they don't get nearly enough credit. Oh, sure. Holtz is amazing. Yeah. I mean, just what, I mean, really the gold standard for, for two decades. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, and some, some people argue in the new era, it's, you know, the, the Dodgers are now kind of taking that mantle or even the, the Rays, but I mean, you'll never see three pitchers on one staff like that. I mean, that, that was amazing. Although people forget Maddox didn't start there, but still it was, um, it, it and was. And it wasn't just them. So, I mean, they had 20 game winners in Denny Nagel and Kevin Millwood right. pitching out of their number four spot. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and then they also had, you know, a, a hard luck guy in, in Steve Avery, who for a while was a great pitcher, but just never seemed to, well, to he got win. Hurt. He got uh, hurt early. Yeah. yeah. Ken uh, Merker had a nice little run, too. He was... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had uh, just to name drop, Charlie Liebrandt was my son's youth basketball coach when oh, we moved oh, there oh, in wow. 1997. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> he, at that I... point, he had just retired a couple of years ago, and he was the uh, club champion at the Country Club of the South and drove his kids to school. He had every morning. That was it. And then he coached youth basketball. Nice guy. Wonderful guy, but don't mention Kirby Puckett in his presence. <laughs> oh, 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 he let it, it was a. Uh, uh, he gave up that homer. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> game six in uh, 91. Yeah. yeah. That was an incredible game. Oh my I can only remember this. game seven. Well, I guess game seven was more, was that the Morris game? Smoltz. That was yes, Smoltz right. Smoltz Morris, game. of course. Yeah. Right. I don't remember I what Puckett did in that game, but game six, he was. Question from Phil coming in in the chat. What would surprise me the most? The Flames are really the most surprising thing. I, I sort of expected those to be kind of jokey chapters, just kind of making fun of Southerners, not understanding what's going on in the games. And there was a lot of that, like every time the they, thought they cheered icing, um, they, they just fundamentally didn't understand the game. But uh, boy, they certainly loved going to the Flames game. It was a great, uh, an unprecedented attraction for them. And the team was well built. They had a GM named Cliff Fletcher, who ends up later being for the Calgary Flames, the guy who wins them the, up in 1989 um he was able to build a team from the ground up because he knew nobody in atlanta knew anybody in the nhl so even if they got bobby hall or something this what it wasn't going to bring anybody into in, in, game in atlanta you know anyway so he just got a bunch of young players built up a team uh defense oriented first because he knew the ice would be soft in atlanta and they they found a way to win so the flames were the biggest surprise to me in my, in my ignorance i always wondered what it's like to be in a area of the country that you can't play hockey in outdoors and, and there were no rinks of skating rinks of any kind in the state of georgia when the flames got there hmm. not a place to go skating on a sunday afternoon or anything i mean that that was it the closest pro hockey team was a minor league team that had been in knoxville that went out of business in 68 <laughs> so there was just no connection to it whatsoever was it just exotic then that you could go watch people skate on ice I, I think basically, yeah, I, th I think essentially. And I, I think part of it was also the players not wearing helmets. It was also particularly dramatic here in the NHL with lots of fights and crazy games in this time period. The players were exotic, you know, had these French names and they spoke a foreign language. I mean, I think in Atlanta, Atlanta was not nearly as cosmopolitan then as it is now. Actually, pro soccer had a fairly good run for a couple of years in Atlanta in the late 60s, too. They had a team called the Atlanta Chiefs who won Atlanta's first championship of any kind in 1968. And those were all European guys. And those guys were they had a particularly large female fan base, the Chiefs. These are all these kind of suavely well-paid, well-dressed European, you know, kind of cosmopolitan guys. Uh, and they got a lot of interest in, in that regard. Clayton, what prompted you to write the book? When I was in grad school at Boston College, I was looking for a topic on my dissertation. I wanted to write about uh, the history of franchise relocations in North America. I said I wanted to do a continent-wide project, and my advisor told me, this is going to take you 70 years. Pick a city, 
use it as a case study to describe the themes you want to. And Atlanta, because they're really the first city to um, kind of go from zero to 60 in terms of pro sports, that's why I picked them. And it was the best advice I ever had in terms of- uh, Yeah, I'll tell project. you, my, my sense in Atlanta, I mean, one of the reasons I moved to Maryland from there and both of my professional children who thank me for that is, <laughs> Atlanta was 49th in per pupil spending for education, but if you needed a new stadium, they'd come up with the dollars <laughs> right away. Uh, I mean, you think about it, they've had three baseball stadiums since 1966. Uh, they built two different arenas for hockey and basketball. The Omni went, came down and it was Phillips Arena when I was there. I don't yep. know what they, what they call it now. They built the, they built State the, uh, they built two domes for football. Right. And yeah, you know, Atlanta has hosted the Olympics. It is hosted uh, quite famously. I mean, it's, the, it's numerous Final Fours, Super Bowls. Um, I mean, they have gone all in. And yes, they wrap themselves in the corporate sports dollars. But if, if it was somebody's goal for them to be a big league sports city, they had, I would say they accomplished it. I, I agree. I agree completely. Yeah, I don't think it was quite what the original guys envisioned, but whatever it is, exactly what, you know, 10 yeah. years down the road. Um, I mean, in spite of the title, I'm, I'm you know, in no way contemptuous of the guys who pushed for this. Nobody had really tried this before. I mean, I admire their, um, I admire their tenaciousness uh, that, you know, that they brought to this. So what other your best interview? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What other city do you think has done it as well? A similar city? Maybe um, I mean, Phoenix, re Phoenix really got things Phoenix, going pretty yeah. well. I mean, it, it really, if you look, it starts out, the Suns are there way before anybody else. And the Suns were very popular. They were consistently good in the Western Conference in the NBA. They had a strong ownership group built around Jerry Colangelo. Uh, and essentially, the other teams, I think, built on that initial success. There have been ups and downs, but they've, you know, they've been able to maintain being a four-sport town. But it was a long time before they got the other three. Yeah, Atlanta I mean, they, the, Suns come to, yeah, the Suns come to town in 68. They don't get a second team until 87. And then they rapidly get, you know, three teams in a seven-year period after that. We're, we're running um, right. towards the end of the hour here. Phil, you had a question. Uh, maybe you want to, could you say it out loud? You take yourself off mute and ask the, ask the question. I think you're shy. Oh, oh, Phil, maybe. in regards to the, the Leo Frank, uh, the yeah, yeah, Leo okay, Frank case. See it. Go ahead. Yes, I belong. He first, his first question was, what did you learn that most surprised you? And then the other is about the Leo Frank case. Maybe yeah, I, I talked I talk, I yeah. talk about the flames for the first question. For the second question, I touch on Leo Frank only briefly. There's a lot of great stuff written about that. It's a very famous case uh, of, a, you know, of a lynching in Georgia and anti-Semitism in the very early 20th century. I touch on that primarily because of a riot that happens near Atlanta Stadium in 1966, the Summerhill riots. It's the largest riot in Georgia since the Leo Frank riots. I mean, so it's only primarily in reference uh, in reference to that. Um, there's many other great books that deal with that case. I mean, I'm focused on a later time period. In terms of anti-Semitism, I do discuss that a little bit in the book in part because Somebody asked my best interview. It may well have been Sam Massel, who was the mayor of Atlanta from 1969 through 1973, who is the guy who negotiates the Omni deal, which is such a much better deal than the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium one. In that the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium deal, a property tax paid for it. Uh, every you know everybody in town was paying for it. Uh, with the Omni Coliseum, they got public. Uh, they were able to borrow money publicly, but the Cousins uh, organization ended up paying for the whole thing. So he did a very good job with that. Massel certainly faced anti-Semitism in his, in his political rise. There was, a, there was a degree of that during his mayoral campaign as well. So I touch on a little bit on the history of anti-Semitism in Atlanta, which for many years had had a, had a very prominent uh, uh, Jewish community dating back into the late 19th century. Any ball players that were particularly good interviews? I don't know if you interviewed many. Bill Clement, uh, who played for the Flames, was fantastic. Ron Reed, who was a pit, very good pitcher oh, yeah. in the 70s, couldn't have been nicer. I mean, he gave me like an hour and a half, two hours of his time. Um, I talked with Tommy Nobis, who was the first guy ever picked by the Atlanta Falcons. He was great. Um, Milo Hamilton, who was the uh, announcer oh, yeah. for the for the he, he was the announcer for the Braves in the 60s and 70s, later for the Astros. He was a great, great conversation as well. 
boy, that Astros organization, at least in that time period, was very easy to work with. I gave them a call because he'd most recently worked with them uh, about wanting to talk to him. And they said, sure, we'll look into it. And within an hour, Milo Hamilton gave me a phone call. So, I mean, they, they could, couldn't have been a better group to work with at that point, at least. What are you working on next? I am working on a book about uh, college basketball in Boston in the 1980s. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh-oh. Roddy Perry. <laughs> oh, I talked to him for the book. I'm sure you did. <laughs> and the gambling scandals kind of started the... the Pretty decade. cop. Oh, that's, that, that, that's, that's part of it. You know, you got you Patino, Calhoun, uh, Gary Williams, Tom Davis, Mike Jarvis, all that stuff. You know, anybody- Calhoun, I was the first guy to interview Calhoun after he was named Coach of the Year in the 88 because I was working for a tiny newspaper called the Dedham Trans- Daily Transcript. Whoa, and wow. he had been the coach of Dedham High School. That was his first job as a head coach. And wow. um, couldn't have been nicer when I interviewed him. Oh, he was, yeah, he, we, it seemed like he was my old buddy at the Legion Hall or something when we chatted. He was great. He refused to throw sure out if we're pitch. going to get cut off here at nine o'clock. I, we may be able to go over or we may get cut off. I'm not really sure. I'm wearing my Kike Hernandez shades, by the way. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah. They were a giveaway you know, you know, so at LA Park on September 18th. As a Connecticut talk native. Talk about what our chapter's been up to, too. I mean, I, just to address that aspect oh, yeah, of right. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I moved after I finished grad school, I moved back to Vermont in 2018 and I've been, been a part of the Boston chapter and occasionally attended and still mm-hmm. wanted the opportunity to go to Sabre meetings. There's a guy named Tom Simon, who for many years had run the Vermont chapter, the chapter had been inactive for a few years. I sent him a note. He said, send an email out and see if people want to do it. And um, ever since then, we've been holding meetings as best we can in 2018 and 2019. I think we held a half dozen meetings, a couple of research meetings. We went to some minor league ball games in town, um, uh, had some other get togethers. Um, we, we voted for the hall of, we'd do a get together for trivia and voting on the hall of fame with zoom and everything. We've actually been meeting more. I think we've met 10 or 12 times, both in 2020 and 2021. It's been great being able to get more guests from, you know, other places through authors and stuff. We have authors on frequently. The other night we had a guy named Jack Bales on who wrote a book about uh, the uh, Billy Jurgis uh, uh, scandal in the 1930s. Uh, he got he got shot by a uh, ex-lover, and that was a great talk. Had a lot of fun with him the other night. Um, love to have you guys on our meetings anytime. We probably have we have about 20 people or so who are who are active. It's not all the same people all the time, but uh, at our meetings, I think we tend to have 10 or 12 on our zooms. And, you've been uh, one of the most. You you've been one of the more active chapters uh, on Zoom, the, the Vermont chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because well, we got to pick up the pace. We got to pick I'm up. In, the pace. I'm in the. I'm actually in the Bob Davids chapter in DC. I mean, COVID. I'm, I'm a lifelong huge Sox fan, so uh, COVID has actually been good for me because yeah. I can get on, some, get on things like this that I would never um, be able to access. But Clayton, I did want to mention the Hawks briefly. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at the, and I don't know if we're going to have time real quick, but the St. Louis Hawks team that moved to Atlanta was mm-hmm. loaded. Oh, I go into great detail about that. Okay. I, love, and, I think they're the and, most underrated NBA team of all time. And almost exclusively black. Mo- I, th- I think, yeah. Go ahead. Absolutely. Take it. I mean, and that's <laughs> they end up moving in part because they can't draw on St. They go from having Pettit and Hagan and all those guys. This team well, doesn't draw in St. Louis, and then they draw even worse in Atlanta. I mean, they, and they get the rid of. Year. If you look at the transactions the Hawks made in their first few years in Atlanta, they're getting rid of. They're letting Joe Selmo Beatty, Wilkins, Hazard, so Selmo yeah. Beatty, and they're throwing all their support behind P. Maravich, who is and they put him in an incredibly bad position. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of one of the yeah. I go into a lot of detail about that in the book. Evan, look at the talent. Evan, you wanted to, you had something uh, you wanted to bring to the group's attention? Yes, it, it, thank you. This is a, a, com- a commercial announcement. I think a couple of years ago, some of you may have been at the meeting where the Moonlight Graham Society was announced. Its formation was formed by three of us who played in one minor league baseball game. Hmm. We're getting ready to induct our first member, our class of 2021. We found someone else who's done the same thing and we're going to be evaluating their candidacy shortly. We'd like to do a little bit of PR and we're looking for somebody who has a good network of baseball contact 
tax and is willing to write up a press release with us but really we want to get the word out about the Moonlight Graham Society and what it, what it is and how much fun it is. And we just need someone who has some baseball contacts, a baseball network that can help us get a press release out. So I put something on the Boston Sabre Facebook page if you want to check there, but anyone that can help us with that, we would really appreciate it. Would it be something we could minor do a Boston game? Chapter Sabre event around? I'm, I'm yeah. sorry? Could we do a Boston Chapter Sabre event? talking about on the induction well we we, we did we did uh have that at, at, the, at the, the downstairs there yes uh, yeah no i remember yeah. um and we, we we're, we're always happy to come back but we think we need to come back with help we want to get other people yeah. to, to tell help tell our story i heard a great interview on uh oh, you did no now you can hear me i no, I, yes. I, I heard a great interview on the rob nyer saber broadcast the other day I don't think it was a new one, but he was interviewing somebody. Now I can't remember who it was, whose grandfather was a Moonlight Graham guy. Okay. They played one game as a catcher for the uh, McGraw Giants in like 1926. But he okay. also had a brother who played. I mean, not this, the guy who played in 26, had a brother who played and a father and an uncle who they're all mm -hmm. catchers. They all had, you know, um, mm -hmm. not huge major league careers, but. That was a real neat Moonlight Graham guy. And, and that's, I think, um, the guest whose name is escaping me, but I think he's a very successful writer, wrote a whole book, maybe called The 30,000 Pound Bat or something, that okay. was prompted by his grandfather being a Moonlight Graham guy. So you might want to look him up. Evan, did you say that this was one minor league game? or major? One minor league game. Oh, oh sorry. Minor, not minor, major league. Yes, there, there was. Yeah. There were. Th there, there's three of us who, at different times, found a very sympathetic minor league team that allowed us each to play in one minor oh league game, despite our total lack of skill. Yeah, you know, we, we saw, I was at that meeting. That was a great meeting. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. a great talk you guys gave. Yeah. Thank that's, you. That's cool. Because I knew a guy when I covered the Bristol Red Sox back in 1981. They had a catcher named John Licker who played mm -hmm. one game and only one game for the Boston Red Sox, just as Steve Lemasny did too. Yeah, I think I wrote both of their bios for bio <laughs> Well, uh, I, I just uh, want to say that that I, I, for Sabre, I get a chance to look at some of Bill's work and the most amazing Bill's thing amazing. was Bill, <laughs> was who, who was the catcher that was on the team for the entire year and only had 10 at bats? Roger LaFrancois. Yes, oh, and he batted 400. He batted yeah. 400. I, knew, I knew Roger. Roger played in Bristol as well. Um, yeah. The pride of Jewett City, Connecticut. You know, one yeah. of my favorite stat lines of all time is that Bob Montgomery, the last man not to wear a helmet, um, his last year, I think it was 80 or 79. No, 79, I think. It was 80, I think yeah. He had like 380. He was like 25 <laughs> for 55 or something. And I'm like, what? Didn't that get you one more year? You know, at least spring training. They released him at the end of the year. Yeah. He was probably almost 40 years old. He was. He, he was almost <laughs> yeah. 30 as a rookie. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I was impressed by that. I feel you came out, you, you said you were in a public place before, so you couldn't speak. Then you logged out and came back in again. I don't know if you're still in the public space or if you could speak, but uh, if you want to say something, it's a good time. You just have to unmute. <laughs> So Joanne, this is a good idea. I yeah. think that, and, and you, who, you, who, you may do another New England chapter. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I've dropped a few hints um, to uh, perhaps our next likely candidate, uh, perhaps. Uh, but we will go through, we'll, we'll get somebody from Springfield and then Connecticut. Yeah, and well, Len, Len Levin. Oh, oh, you're giving it all the way, Saul. Oh, sorry. I just was a guess. No, no, no. no that's all right. I hinted at uh, Len just the other day, so it's all right. But that, <laughs> that's uh, my major target, yeah. Uh, and I would like to see if we can conjure up somebody from the, albeit um, defunct, uh, main chapter. I mean, I do still have a few names and everything that maybe we can get one of them just to come and talk about either what happened or you know, what we can do about everything. So... Uh, but um, we might even go further afield. I, I, there they used to be some in um, Atlantic Canada, but apparently they've disappeared also. But that would have been sort of an interesting thing since um, 
uh, a lot of uh, Nova Scotia people do watch the Red Sox. They have a huge Facebook group. The, well, uh, they, the, the they, Blue Nose Brotherhood. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, okay. A lot of big, well, a lot of big Red Sox fans on that Facebook yeah, group. If anybody hasn't checked that out, just look up Blue Nose, all one word, Blue Nose Brotherhood. Yeah. I think it's Bruno's the Blue, Sox, Blue Nose Bow Sox Brotherhood or something. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, it uh, doesn't have to be a chapter. It can be a Bruno. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And maybe we can get somebody on that. Yeah, Bruno's Clayton, Brothers. what's the name of your chapter? Is it like the Birdie Tevitz chapter or something? We are the uh, Gardner Waterman chapter. Oh, that's uh, Larry Gardner and um, uh, Waterman's a guy who was a research, uh, researcher in our chapter many uh, years ago who passed away. And uh, yeah, I mean, before I, I got involved. Um, Can I ask one last question before we finish? Yeah. Is that is that is that uh, is that professor still with us? And if so, you've got to give him an autograph book. Which professor? The guy who the, who suggested you do your dissertation on. Oh, of you know, course, OCD. absolutely. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, I yeah. got a paragraph about her in my uh, in my oh, acknowledgement. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. What year did you graduate BC? Uh, I got my PhD in 2018. That's when I headed up to Vermont and. Uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I grew up across the street from BC. My mother still lives in the house I grew up in on Manette Road. Well, I, so, I lived across the street in one of those. There was a house that had they rented rooms, but like everything else was like owned by the by the school, so it was very weird. You get a very weirdly institutional life. So was I lived, it on I lived Con there Ave? You. Was it on Con? No, or? it's on what's it called? Um, Crosby Manette. There's like there's like the, the 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 bus stop is right you know the one of those oh uh, oh yeah 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 oh what's the name of that street no I know and actually right there was like one house that the guy was holding out and he was that's where I was yeah, yeah 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 and he got but I yeah I ended up getting like a Priscilla Road yes yes that's it yeah yep. yeah yeah like the guy got like a gajillion dollars for the house in the end <laughs> yeah. I I don't know if the one I'm thinking of I don't know if it's been sold Did it yet. not sell oh okay yeah I, I, I know yeah. One's he's waiting for it to be a billion dollar house i guess sir yeah well it might make it <laughs> well thanks everybody uh, joanne any closing thoughts um uh well poem i, I oh, well i probably have one here <laughs> well, i don't know i just have one here it's on harry merch in maine but i'm, I'm not going to read that one it's too long for one thing but <laughs> um I, I you know i think that this is a great idea also clayton thank you very much and thanks for you, having me what a pleasure have right. you have you done this for anybody down in atlanta uh they, the they, they've been holding out on me so far they keep saying they're going to have me on i've talked I oh. talked to everybody else in the continental United States, but uh, right. them at this point. Uh, yeah, no, very, out. very, very yeah. good with the questions and answers too. Yes, yeah. absolutely, very good. And um, if they don't, uh, you know, we really should advocate for you to get down there because they're missing out on a very, very good uh, presentation. And Just be careful. Yeah. You're, you're, you're so clearly a Yankee that you might not be. <laughs> oh, I, I, I spent several months in Georgia. <laughs> I've spent several months in Georgia. I'm very, very familiar with uh, it. <laughs> I had somebody, I had somebody say uh, to me when I was part of the wave of people moving down there in the '90s. I was, I was out to lunch with a woman who was uh, editor of a magazine, and she said, "You know, the last time the Yankees invaded, they had the good manners to go home when they were done." <laughs> After they burn the place to the ground, right? Well, yeah, but <laughs> there, there is that. Yeah. There is that, yeah. Well, the, the stadium was presented frequently as, like, finally, we have rebuilt after 100 years after Sherman kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. In the Atlanta underground, there are still parts of the original Atlanta that you can see walls from. Because what, when Atlanta was burned to the ground, they literally built on top of the debris. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. incredible. All right. Oh, my phone's ringing. I think my wife is probably yelling at me to eat dinner. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We're going to do this more often. Thank you. Thank you.